Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for spending your Saturday morning with me. Um, I'm going to talk over the next hour or so. I will try and keep the time. There's so you very well. But you can wave your hands frantically if I'm over time. Um, I'm going to spend the next hour or so talking about some research that I've been doing over the last decade or so, but uh, particularly picking up on this idea of house and home in prehistory since I came to Cal in 2012. Can you turn it up a little bit? Yeah, sure. There we go. So, and I tend to move around and gesticulate while I talk, so I'll try not to do it too violently with this microphone in front of me. So what I'm going to talk about today is an idea that I've been working on, not only with my colleagues in Jordan, where the archaeological material that I'm going to talk about today comes from, but also with colleagues at Cal since my arrival here, including Meg Conkey, an archaeologist uh, recently retired from the Department of Anthropology, um, a colleague of mine who uh, I've now been working with closely since arriving here, on this idea of looking back into deep prehistory, so back before we traditionally think of villages and people establishing relationships with people in one place for long periods of time, things we would start to call towns and villages, things that eventually lead to urbanization and civilizations that the Near East in particular is, is very well known for. So what I'm going to talk about today is that this idea of hunter-gatherers who are traditionally thought of as being mobile across a landscape, not being tied to any one place, actually being exactly the opposite of what we've thought for many, many years. So this idea of hunter-gatherers thinking of not only individual places, that we would call sites in archaeology, but also landscapes as houses and homes, as particularly important places throughout their lifetime. So this idea that hunter-gatherer houses are more than just these flimsy little tent-like structures, which you can see here. And as I've kind of alluded to, this comes back to the very traditional view, particularly in Near Eastern archaeology, but really in the way we see hunter-gatherer archaeology across the globe, this idea that in the Paleolithic, when people were hunter-gatherers, they lived in very flimsy structures, very ephemeral campsites. They moved from place to place, had no particular attachment to particular locations, and lived in what is depicted very cartoony here on the right as being a, a series of very flimsy, hut-like, brush-like structures. Nothing permanent, nothing that's really marked archaeologically in the landscape. And you can see just a few of the publications here how people write about them traditionally, including one you may know by myself and my colleagues. And this is in contrast to the way we think about the next archaeological period in the Near East, what we call the Neolithic, which is very well known for the origins of agriculture. It's what most people study in terms of the beginnings of sedentary village life, staying in one place, constructing these very large, <coughs> relatively permanent villages that we can easily recognize archaeologically, um, being involved in social relationships that involve hierarchies, so having people like chiefs and chiefdoms, and producing their own food, so domesticating animals and domesticating plants. And I'm going to show, through my work in Jordan, that this dichotomy of what we see in the Neolithic and what we see with hunter-gatherers isn't quite so clear-cut, even when we go back quite deep in prehistory. So the area that I'm talking about here, which is, is the, what we call the Levant. So it's the modern-day countries of Jordan, southern Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, the West Bank, and even parts of northern Egypt. So what I've highlighted in this orange box. In particular, the area where I do my field research in, is in a region of eastern Jordan called the Azraq Basin, which, I can use my arrow here, is blown up here. You can see these dots represent a variety of different hunter-gatherer sites that relate to the same time period that I'm going to be talking about today, the Epipaleolithic period, which I'll explain in a moment. And in particular, the area where I conduct my research is in this dashed line here, and the site I'm going to focus on is located right here, a site called Karana. 
So again, just to reiterate this idea of what we see in the Neolithic versus what we see earlier on in the Paleolithic, so the New Stone Age versus the Old Stone Age, what's really concerned researchers and archaeologists over this time period since really the turn of the century <coughs> is trying to identify the origins of agriculture, the first domesticated plants, the first domesticated animals, in order to have or basically to manage a landscape around you, it often involves staying permanently around that landscape. So you can tend to fields, and you can tend to herds of animals. So you might be moving a little bit, but not a great deal. And so archaeologists have kind of divvied up this part of the world, especially when we get to the Neolithic, by giving the people who live in this area different labels depending on what their economic strategies are. So people who do more hunting versus more herding versus more hunting and gathering. The time period I'm talking about predates all of these distinctions. But what I hope to point out today shows us that people are doing very complicated things even before we start drawing these borders based on economic strategies. And this time period that I am going to talk about today is called the Epipaleolithic. The Epi is basically just denoting that it is between the Paleolithic or the Old Stone Age and the Neolithic and the New Stone Age. So we're talking about roughly a 10 to 12,000 year time period, so actually quite a substantial time period, after the Paleolithic and before the Neolithic period. So spanning from about 23,000 to 11,500 years before present. In particular, the site that I'm going to talk about spans an even shorter time period of that, in the earliest part of the Epipaleolithic, for about 1,000 years, around 19,000. 19,000 years ago. So, what these columns here on the left are showing is how we reconstruct the climate based on various lines of evidence, including pollen cores, oxygen isotopes that we can get from cave deposits, that give us an idea of temperature and precipitation in the past. And what they tell us is that we have warm and wet periods and cool and dry periods over this 10 to 12,000 years of the Epipaleolithic which I've noted here, the blue are representing cold and dry periods, and the orangish color are representing warm and moist periods. So the site that I'm talking about is supposed to be occupied during a cold and dry period, but the evidence that we're getting from the site that I'll talk about over the next hour actually shows it to be a very lush, very well-watered, very different environment to what our, our regional climatic data is telling us. This period, the Epipaleolithic, is very easy to distinguish archaeologically because it happens to have a very hallmark stone tool associated with it. And these are these very tiny stone points that you can see here, which are called microliths. So this is about a centimeter, this scale right here, to give you an idea. So we're talking about pieces that are really just anywhere from a centimeter and a half to three centimeters in size. Our cutoff is five. And these appear pretty abruptly with the Epipaleolithic period, and they disappear with the onset of the Neolithic. So they're a very well-defined technology, which we associate and as, uh, we, which we associate with the Epipaleolithic, and allows us to easily identify, even without other lines of evidence, sites as belonging to this time period. The idea with these microliths or these small stone tools is that you have several of them together <coughs> into one bone handle, which you can see right here. So hopefully this photograph is clear enough to show you that there are several of these small pieces hafted so that the straight edge, which is the sharp edge of the piece, is sticking out. So you can have essentially a knife or a cutting implement that's made of a variety of different pieces. And you can see this actually, once it's been removed from the ground and conserved, you can see the sickle blade, we call them, in this case, is cutting implement in the black and white photograph, which are often used for cutting plants. Um, we also find them hafted as the tips in projectiles, so as the tips in bows, in atlatl darts. So they're used for a variety of different purposes, and they come in a variety of different shapes. Yes? Have you determined how they would glue the... Uh in some cases, so often it's not well preserved, 
but we, have, we find two different types of hafting residues associated with these microliths. One is either bitumen, which is essentially natural tar that you can get from the Dead Sea. Um, and we find it at a variety of sites. We have some microliths from my site, which is 200 kilometers away from the Dead Sea, which has bitumen attached to it. And the other is a mastic that they use with lime. So basically reducing limestone, which is abundant in this part of the world, to a lime plaster, and then adding things like charcoal and other binding agents that make it like blue, essentially. So the idea with these microliths is that you can make them in a variety of different shapes. You can make a whole bunch of them very easily and very quickly. And you can half them using bitumen or this lime plaster in a variety of different ways, like cutting implements, as in the slide I just showed you, or projectiles with a number of barbs attached to them, such as the drawing that you can see here. So these are easily replaceable parts of composite tools when you're out hunting or when you're in the fields um, harvesting some cereals and one of these little microlith breaks. You're not in trouble. You don't have to entirely abandon that tool. You can just you can just pop out the broken flint, they're usually made from flint, and put a new one in. So you can carry a bunch of spare parts with you. They're very, very tiny, so it's very easy to make, and they're very easy to carry around with you. So the idea is that it's a, a tool you can easily fix on the go. Aside from these very distinctive microliths, the time period is known for a variety of other things. So over this 10,000 or so years in the Epipaleolithic, we start to see a number of dramatic economic, social, technological, symbolic, and ideological changes, including some of our earliest very well-defined hut structures, such as you can see here, even stone structures. So you can see the outline of one here with several individual post holes that would have held the large beams for these structures. We find caches of both symbolic such as these gazelle horn cores, and more utilitarian objects, such as these shaft straighteners used for basically straightening arrows. We find burials. I'm not sure how well you can see it in this photograph, but we have a very large bone dagger buried with this individual, and he's wearing a belt that's woven together of fiber and fox canines, perforated fox canines. We find shell individuals with shell headdresses, and then we find pretty elaborately carved bone and wood implements as well. Now to talk a little bit more specifically about the project that I've been working on, we've been working in the eastern part of Jordan, so that little dashed line I showed you, that dashed area I showed you in the map a couple slides ago, in what we've called the Epipaleolithic Foragers in Azraq Project, or EPAP, for sure. And we've been working in the Azraq Basin at large, but at a number of epipaleolithic hunter-gatherer sites within that basin, and trying to reconstruct not only how the environment has changed, but how people have used the landscape differently over this 10,000 or so years. And we've been working in this area since 2006, really. So this Azraq Basin, this dashed area, which I've blown up here in this photograph, covers about 12,000 square kilometers. It's quite a massive area. And it falls at what is today the boundary between a fairly dry steppe environment, where we have a few scattered trees and small plants and a few river systems, to what we call the true desert, where we have 50 millimeters or less of rain per year. In the center of this Azraq Basin, right where you can see that cluster of black dots in the white topographic line there, is the Azraq Oasis, which since about 500,000 years ago, including until the present day, although much less so, as water is a big issue in this part of the world, there's been a large oasis, which even in the 1970s looked very much like this, a photograph from 73, now drying out substantially as it's a main water source for Jordan, which is a water deprived country, especially over the last 10 years or so where there's been a sustained drought. And so most of this water is now pumped to Amman, the capital, which means the wetlands is, is a very small fragment of what it once was, 
However, 20,000 years ago, it was a very lush area that supported a very large area, um, denoted by this dashed, denoted by this dashed line here. So about 12,000 square kilometers, all of which drained toward this oasis. About 40 kilometers to the west of this oasis is a really unusually large archaeological site that very quickly became the focus of our research in this part of Jordan. And this is a photograph of the site, or at least a part of the site, and our excavations in 2010. So one thing I want you to get a feel for just looking at this photograph is what the landscape looks like today, which is pretty stark, pretty bare, pretty open, not a tree to be had in a number of years, uh, in a number of kilometers around the site. There are a few small brushes that mark a modern wadi, which is a seasonal river, so we only have water there in the rainy part of the year, which in this case is April, March and April. So which does attract some wildlife, including these camels, but by and large, a pretty stark environment. And you can see a few other photographs of the site here. This site is Harana 4. It's named number four because there are a whole series of sites in that river basin. It was the fourth one that happened to be found during survey work. What's particularly unusual for the site, about this site, is that it's about 20,000 square meters in size, which is absolutely enormous for a Paleolithic site. The largest one that I'm aware of in the Near East, and in fact, if I can be so bold as to say it, the largest one I'm aware of globally at this point. It also is incredibly archaeologically dense. What you can see in this photograph, which is a, an aerial photograph, it was taken from a helicopter flying over the site. This is actually the extent of the site here. You can see these excavation areas. We've been excavating there since 2008. Two main areas that we've opened up. And each one of those is about 30 to 40 square meters in size. So just to give you a, a bit of an idea of the size of the site. This is that little, little wadi or river valley that had the camels walking through it. And there is so much material at the site um, that it's a bit of a challenge in excavations. Just to give you an idea, the photograph on the lower right is the surface of the site. And everything that you can see, all of those stones are actually artifacts. <laughs> and that density of material actually continues with depth. The site is about a meter and a half deep with basically chocked full of these flints, as well as animal bone, shell, and a variety of other features that I'm going to talk about. Our excavations, as I said, are focused in two main areas. In particular today, I'm going to talk about this area, area B, which is the earlier of the two occupations. So we have early part of the Epipaleolithic over here, and a little bit later in the Epipaleolithic. But what I'm going to talk about is our findings in this excavation area, where we found a number of interesting things. We found interesting things in both, but in order to get us out of here in an hour. <laughs> and just to give you an idea of what it's like excavating there, it's a photo with the camels in the wadi. It wasn't, wasn't uh, enough. We often have camel visitors, especially now that the Department of Agriculture has built a large reservoir a couple hundred meters away from the site. It's very, very sunny. We are in the hot sun all day long. We start excavating at about 4.30 in the morning as soon as the sun comes up and finish excavating around noon because it's a little bit unbearable after that. In the spring, it also is very windy. So we start to get the sandstorm winds that come through this part of the Middle East, uh, part of the Hamsin. And you can see we often have trouble excavating in this wind, including keeping out shade tents, which would alleviate the other issue, the sun at the site. Having said that, it's a very fascinating place to work, and so we trudge through it all and continue, continue working there. From the base of the site, so the very earliest occupations, to the surface, we're talking about a time span of about 800 to 1,000 years. So the Epipaleolithic is 23,000 years to 11 and a half thousand years, we're talking about 12,000 years in duration, 
our site was occupied only for about 800 to 1,000 of those years. So a really small fraction of the Epipaleolithic period as a whole. And we're talking about the very beginning of that time period. And here we just have a series of radiocarbon dates, which come from deposits from the very bottom of the site, our oldest dates, to the top of the site, the surface deposits, which are our youngest dates. And they come from deposits, such as you can see on the two photographs on the right-hand side. So we're talking about really, really well-preserved stratigraphy, really, really well-preserved features within that, which is something that's very rare for sites of this time period. Because it's in the middle of nowhere, it's not been very heavily disturbed, because it's a very dry desert environment, and has been so since the onset of the Holocene, everything is pretty well preserved. So we have a very uh, fortunate set of circumstances which allow us to get the kind of information that we're able to get out of this site, including very well preserved parts, which is what this black deposit along here is, which is full of charcoal, which is what we use to get these radiocarbon dates. Now I mentioned I'm only going to talk about one of our excavation areas, and that is the early epipillary, so the earliest part of the site. And to give you an idea of what some of these stratigraphic deposits look like, so we're talking about natural and cultural activities that make up all of the deposits at the site. And what I hope you can see from comparing the photograph with our own drawing of these deposits is that we have a whole lot of individual layers each of which represent, in some cases, individual hearth events, the cleaning out and dumping of the ash from a hearth, what that dark stain is that you can see both in the photograph and in the line drawing, is actually the floor of a hut structure. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Again, I mentioned our preservation is really great. We can see, hopefully you can in these photographs, this kind of dark, almost pie-shaped uh, stain that you can see in the upper corner here is actually a hearth as we excavate, as we come down on it from the surface. So all of those little black flecks are pieces of charcoal, kind of about nickel-sized or so, which are perfect for giving us all these radiocarbon dates. We can actually tell the age of these deposits by dating the carbon contained in this charcoal. And what I'm uh, hoping you can see is oh, another hearth here. So you can see they're pretty distinct, full of these dense charcoal concentrations, and this gray overall coloring, which is the very fine ash, once the charcoal is broken down, from burning in situ. In the upper photograph, what I hope you can see, the arrow is pointing to one of these kind of gray streaks. Right below it is an orange streak, then we have a gray, then an orange, then a gray. So those are actually hearths that are interspersed with um, compact earth surfaces. So we have a hearth on what is essentially a floor, another hearth on a floor, another hearth on a floor. So we have a very unique situation of having excellent preservation of things that are often very difficult for us to see at these sites. One of the reasons why I'm talking about the earliest occupation of the site, the early epipaleolithic, is because of the hut structures that we found there. So, like one of the structures I showed when I was talking about the overall uh, epipaleolithic in general, we have these kind of dark, oval, roughly oval-shaped stains in the ground. We have, in this case, one right here and one right here which are shown by these dashed lines in the photograph. So this very long, oddly shaped one is structure one, which actually in 2013 we went back and excavated and discovered was two structures partially overlapping each other. And another one that you can see over here, which is delineated by these dashed lines right here. What's particularly interesting is not only the presence of these hut structures, which are basically kind of dug slightly, so semi-subterranean, into the existing archaeological deposits at the site. They have their own very distinct character, this very dark, organic, um, organic rich appearance, which I showed you right here. So that dark stain is actually the floor of, or the deposits of this structure right here, taken in this area, 
where you can see we've dug a deep trench. So what's very interesting about these structures is not only how they were built, but how they were used, the material we find inside them, and the material we find in between these structures. So although it's pretty difficult for us to say that all three of these structures were occupied at the same time, we know that they were occupied over a relatively short time span. And probably so close together that people would have remembered where a previous hut structure was and what spaces would have been in between hut structures, especially based on the types of deposits that we find, the types of artifacts we find in and between them. And I've shown in these small photographs around the hut structures some of the things that we have found inside them. So on the floor of this hut right here, we found these articulated vertebrae, which actually belong to a wild cow, Box primogenus. So I'm not sure if you can see the scale particularly well, but each of these vertebrae, there's one, two, three, four, five of them articulated together, which represent a segment of the backbone of a wild cow, and each one of them is about this large. So quite substantial. On top of this hut structure, we actually found three caches of marine shell, and you can see a close-up of this mar these marine shells here. This close-up comes from this area right here. One cache was here, one cache was here, and one cache was over here, surrounding this very large rock. Large rock actually comes from the center of this heart right here, or sorry, the center of this hut right here. And each of those caches of marine shell had a large piece of red ochre associated with it. And then actually in between these huts, we also found a number of caches, including horned cores, in this case ibex, so basically large wild goat, essentially, and gazelle, several of the burnt horned cores from gazelle, that were all placed together right at the perimeter of this hut structure. And in fact, indeed, we found several more of these caches of horned cores in the spaces in between. And here's just further close-ups of some of those things. So you can see this large anvil stone, one, two, three caches of marine shell. Again, a close-up showing the red ochre. This is a close-up of the marine shell from right here, and you can see a big chunk of red ochre. And that was vertebrae that I was talking about. When we actually excavate these hut structures, we're excavating on a very minute scale. So we're excavating with spoons, for example. And in fact, we went back last summer to work on this particular structure. Uh, we were there for four weeks. There was five of us in the field. And all we did was excavate this small area in 25 by 20, 25 centimeter squares with a spoon. It's very, very time consuming. But the information that it can give us is very, very revealing about what's going on with these hut structures. So what we're able to reconstruct by going through these deposits, um, which I'm hoping you can see a bit of a time lapse of here, is that we have first the digging out of what's eventually going to be the floor of these hut structures. Compact earth, very, very clay-rich, compact, partly because it was probably beaten down for use, but also partly because it was probably trampled during the occupation of these structures. So this very light-colored, compact deposit. And in fact, we have several layers of that, so showing that they probably re-floored this hut multiple times. And we have a number of uh, objects that we found in situ on top of these individual floors. Once occupation of the hut was complete, or they weren't interested in living there anymore for whatever reason, it seems that the superstructure of the hearth, which was probably made of a variety of local plants, tamarisk, um, and local brush, was burnt intentionally. So we have evidence of charcoal and this dark organic layer that I was talking about is the burning layer. And you can see, when we get close up, you can see some of this blackened area here, which extends all around the perimeter of this structure. You can see part of it around the edges. So the superstructure was burnt and collapsed in. And then we have the placement of this large stone here, and these caches of marine shell. They sit very carefully on this black burnt layer with the red ochre. And then all of that was actually sealed over intentionally with this orange sand. And this sand doesn't come from anywhere nearby. We've done a lot of 
particle size and geochemical analysis of the sand. We don't know where it comes from. All we can rule out is that they didn't go just off-site to collect it and dump it on-site. So it was brought specially for this, uh, to the site for the purpose of uh, covering over this hot structure once the deposits were placed on the burnt, the burnt material. And then in between these structures, I mentioned we had these caches of horn cores, of ibex and gazelle horn cores. So we have large collections of them, but we also have individual gazelle horn cores, which you can see here, which are still actually attached to the top portion of the skull of the gazelle, which are in place around, outside, but around this head structure in several locations, in three, and I've shown two of them here, sticking straight up. So the gazelle, skull bit is placed on the ground, and then these horn core stand essentially straight up about this high from the surface of the structures. In addition to these horn cores that were intentionally placed around the structures, we also have things like, if you see the two photographs in the upper left, we have what are the four still articulated paws of a fox, which we show just the fox paws on the left, and on the right you can see what we call a core. It's essentially a large nodule, a large chunk of flint, which is what all of these microlithic blades would be made from. So you would carry around one of these cores whenever you needed to make these easily replaceable microliths. You would basically use that core as your raw material to make these bladelets. So we have things like um, fox pelts, which probably still had the, well, still had the, the bones in the feet, so that you have some structural integrity around the foot of the pelt itself, the feet of the pelt. And you can use that as the handles to carry materials such as these flints and the blades and the microliths you produce from them inside your pelt, uh, your, sorry, fox pelt bag. And we find several of these in the spaces in between the hut and inside of the huts as well. Aside from the horn cores, the fox pelt bags, and the cores, we also find caches of already reduced flint. So we have the leftover core, the same as that piece I just showed you before, but we still have all of the small bladelets, all of the small pieces removed from it that the microliths would be made from. And in fact, sometimes we still find the microliths themselves in these little caches. In 2013, I mentioned we went back for a month, a small group of us, to document uh, the excavation of this hut structure. And I've just got a few photographs of that here. Once we've removed all of the deposits I just, I just showed you, we're down to these series of floors that I talked about, these compact earth deposits. And so we have uh, two of these being excavated. Um, this is the upper, most of these floors, and a lower floor that you can see here. So they're quite distinct, very compact deposits. And as we were excavating, we noticed that we kept finding the same types of things on each of these floors which would include concentrations of rocks, most of which had been burnt. So it may represent, although they're probably not in their original position, it may represent the leftovers of a hearth that would have been inside of the structure. We find the partially articulated remains of animals. So like the fox paws that I showed you earlier, we have actually two more examples, one burnt and one unburnt of fox paws on top of these floors as well as more gazelle horn cores, this time not burnt. So this is the top part of the skull of the gazelle and the two horn cores. And we even have other parts of gazelle that are still articulated, including um, the top right is actually the flange, the toe of a gazelle, and the other side is the ankle portion of a gazelle. And the three photographs on the far right are actually showing tortoise shell, so land, uh, turtle land tortoise carapace, which are still largely articulated together. And we just keep finding these deposits on each of the floors. We also find ochre. So you can see 
orange stains here are uh, ochre deposits used as pigments for coloring a variety of different things. We find them in association with these little caches, again, of these microliths uh, that are in the process of being made. And on the left-hand side here, these are, again, marine shell. And I'll come to the significance of the marine shell in, uh, in just a moment. And then finally, another of these deposits, or these objects that we continue or keep finding on each of these floor deposits at the site are bone points. And you can see several examples of them, actually all five of these and another four, so nine in total, came from the lowest of these floor deposits in the hut. Now, after giving you an idea of what the excavations look like, what these hut structures look like, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the material that we found in the hut structures that I've shown in the photographs, some of the analyses that we've done regarding these objects, and then what they can tell us about the big picture, kind of coming back to home and, and house in prehistory. So I've mentioned marine shell. We found not only these marine shell caches within the upper deposits of one of these huts, but we found them in several of the floors, and in fact we find them in deposits outside of the huts in virtually every deposit we've ever excavated from the site. We find these marine shells. So we have them now in the thousands. The reason why the presence of these marine shells is significant is because we're talking about the eastern desert of Jordan, quite distant from any source of marine shell. The closest source is the Mediterranean Sea, which is about 200 and some kilometers away as the crow flies, which if anyone has traveled at all in the Middle East knows that you can't actually go anywhere as the crow flies. Um, it's quite a varied landscape. So we're talking about 200 and some kilometers to the Mediterranean Sea to the west, about 300 and some kilometers to the Red Sea to the south, and then in fact, very interestingly, we also have a very few number of species that come from the Indo-Pacific Ocean which, if you were to go as a crow flies, which would mean crossing the entire Arabian Peninsula, we're talking least distances, <coughs> almost 2,000 kilometers. So quite a substantial distance away from Piranha itself. So we've had numerous students, um, postdoc students, and uh, marine shell specialists go through and, based on the morphology of the individual specimens, identify them to species. And once we identify them to species, we can narrow down which body of water they would have come from. In fact, we can also tell what kind of uh, ecology or habitat these creatures would have lived in in those bodies of water. And so what we can show is that we definitely have material coming from the Mediterranean Sea. Most of it comes from the Mediterranean Sea. Probably not surprising, because it is the closest, even at 200 and some kilometers away. We have material that comes from the Red Sea, and as I mentioned, we have material that comes from the Indo-Pacific Ocean. So we know that people were either bringing shell to the site, perhaps going themselves to get it, these vast distances, or trading with people who lived in the spaces in between, so that kind of down the line through exchange, the shell made it to the site. If we were to kind of map that out, we have Piranha 4 right here, in the eastern desert of Jordan, we have a whole variety of different sites along the Mediterranean coast where people may have been in contact with those individuals or traveled there themselves, down to the Red Sea, and then a variety of routes over to the Indo-Pacific Ocean. Yeah? Were the coastlines changed significantly in that period of history? Yeah, so they would have been even farther away than they are today. So I've given you distances just for today, the, the most um, the closest distances, but it probably would have been further. Not by a great deal, especially for the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. I'm not actually sure the Indo-Pacific, but I imagine the same. But still, you know, tack on 10 or so kilometers. And although I borrowed this image from looking at the upper Paleolithic in Europe, the idea is potentially the same for Piranha. We have a large number of people who were occupying that site to create such a large site over about 800 years. A really archaeologically dense site would have involved a lot of people doing a lot of different things. It may be that people from Piranha were traveling to these coasts and bringing shell back, 
But, as I'm going to show from other lines of evidence, probably the more likely explanation is that people from a variety of other sites, so from these other dots in the region, were actually coming to Quran. Maybe not the whole way, but they were interacting with people in all these spaces in between Purana and these coasts. And we see this in terms of the, the marine shell. And so we may have a kind of shell bead fair scenario at the site where this shell may have been used as currency, it may have been used to broker deals between a variety of different groups, um, it may have been used for, for other social or decorative purposes, maybe something that you wear to show where you've come from or who you are in comparison to other people that maybe you don't interact with on a regular basis. If we look at all these microliths, so these stone tools that the Eddie Paleolithic are known for, one thing that's particularly interesting is, particularly in the time period for the occupation of the site, these microliths come in a variety of different shapes, a variety of different forms. So they come in what we would call lunates, what we would call trapezes, rectangles, triangles, a whole variety of different forms, some of which I've tried to show here, just to give you an idea of the variation. So I'm not going to go through this all. What I just want to point out is that we can actually look at the process, the technologies that are used to produce these different microlith shapes. And we, we can reconstruct those since we have, we know that people were producing these tools on site. You saw the little caches, all of the debris that comes from making the tools is still there. We can actually work backwards, refit and reconstruct the process of making these stone tools to get at the variety of different ways that they were made. So why were people making trapezes and rectangles and lunates and triangles? What was the purpose of having all of these different types of microliths? Well, one hypothesis, and what's actually predominated epipaleolithic research in this part of the world, is that people who lived in different parts of the Levant were making different forms. So you have people up north who were making triangles, you have people along the coast who were making rectangles, you have people in the south who were making trapezes. The idea is that with stone tools, it's not something you can just you know, pick up a piece of flint, a piece of chert, and just make a microlith. It takes a lot of years of practice, and it takes a lot of years of learning. It's learning that has to be passed kind of from master to apprentice. So you can't just pick up a piece of flint and make these different types of microliths. You learn from the people who taught you how to make them, which means that if people have only taught you how to make triangles, from tradition and from your own knowledge, you make triangles, and that's perpetuated generation after generation, is the idea. Yeah. Talking about learning, how advanced was communication language? So, uh, as advanced as we could communicate now. So yeah, we're talking about fully anatomically modern humans, all the language capabilities that we have today. Who knows what that language was? But, and in fact, to be honest, you could actually teach flint mapping without saying a word, but you have to see it. You have to, you have to have someone show you what to do step by step. So you could do it without speaking, it would be trickier. Uh, but as long as you were there to observe what someone else was doing, you could learn the process. But you couldn't, it, it would be very impossible to do on your own. Yeah? Is there any way of figuring out whether they were all speaking the same language? I mean, Unfortunately, that's by how much trade happened. Well, so the idea, and what what um, I would argue for this site is that even if they spoke different languages or different dialects, you know, if we're talking about a London accent versus a Newcastle accent in England, even if it was different dialects, they could clearly still communicate with each other, um, and I think that bears out in the archaeological record, and in particular with these stone tools. Because what we see at Piranha is we don't have just triangles, we don't have just rectangles, we don't have just lunates, we don't have just trapezes, we have everything. So if you learn what's taught to you in making these different forms, then 
One possible explanation for why we find all of these forms of Harana is because we have people coming from a variety of different areas and practicing their own traditions at that site in Flint Napping, and perhaps sharing those traditions with other people, which is why we have such variability at this site that we don't find in any of the other contemporary sites. So we can see that not only in the way they're producing these stone tools, but also in those final pieces themselves. So all of these traditions that I've talked about, I've tried to represent with these green arrows, we find they come from a variety of different areas, but we find all of them present at this site in the stone tool assemblage. And even when we look at the use of these microliths, so I have a, a colleague of mine who studies under the microscope under very high magnification, 500 or more times magnification, looking under a scanning electron microscope, for example, you can look at the very minute wear traces on the edges of these flint tools. So this is a space of one millimeter. So we're getting the detail of a fracture that you can see on the edge of a piece of flint about one millimeter in width. And different activities produce different types of damage or wear on the edge of a tool. So using a tool as a projectile produces what we call impact fractures, which are the two things in the top and bottom you can see there. Using it as a knife or a saw creates linear striations, and so on and so forth. So we can reconstruct the types of activities people were doing with these microliths by looking at the wear patterns. And when we do that, I'll get when we do that, we find that there's no correlation between the shape of the tools. So whether or not it's a trapeze, a rectangle, a triangle, a roommate, doesn't matter. There's no correlation between the type of a tool and what it's used for. But what we can say is most of them, as you can see here, were used as projectiles. Other ones as cutting tools. We have a whole large category, most of them which say not used. If you remember, I mentioned that these were easily replaceable parts of composite tools. So it seems that a lot of what we sampled are actually the backups, the pieces that had not yet been hacked and used, which is why we have a large category of not used. Yeah. What do you mean by drilling? So using the, the point of one of these microliths, you can drill through, for example, the shell, which is how you get all the perforations through those marine shells to be able to straighten them up. One thing I didn't mention is that we've actually done the same type of high magnification analysis of the shell and discovered that most of them were coated in red ochre and all of them had been intentionally drilled and had evidence of having been strung. So probably for ease of carrying, if we're carrying these you know, a couple hundred or more kilometers, then you want to not lose them all on the way. The easiest thing is just to string them all together. Yeah? What is red ochre? So red ochre is basically a, uh, it's a form of, actually it comes in a variety of different chemical formulas, but in general it's a form of um, hematite, so an iron-rich stone uh, that's oxidized to create the red color, so basically like it's rusted, um, but it's a really dense, uh, in really dense mineral form that's often used in prehistory, well in fact even today, as a pigment, because it has this really, really strong, go back, this really, really strong red color. So this is an orange one. You can get an orange, yellow, red, and any variety in between. But if we go back here, you can see this red color really stands out. It's pretty vibrant. And it's very durable. So it lasts in the archaeological record, which is very nice for us. Changes from having 
these very small micro lens to actually having bigger, chunkier ones, and having a variety of different raw material types, which actually leads me to what I was going to say right now. So maybe I'll get to that point, and then I can answer your, your question. So we know that people were making different types of these stone tools, probably bringing that knowledge to the site. We know they're not bringing the flint to the site, so they're not bringing the actual tools from these other sites to Verona 4. They're just bringing the knowledge on how to make it with them. And the reason that we can say this is because we've done a pretty extensive geological survey of the deposits around the site. So we've mapped out the local geology, and we've gone to all of these outcrops and studied the flint, the type of flint that's available in the surrounding area. And we can do petrographic, so we can actually do either geochemical, or we can actually look at the structure of the flint itself under the microscope, compare it to the flint that we find at the site, and we find that everything that we find in our archaeological deposits comes from within 20 kilometers of the surrounding landscape. So they're getting the flint from around the site, but they're making things that we only find at pretty distant sites. So, and we see a variety, a wide variety of raw material at the site, particularly as time goes on. So they're becoming more experimental, grateful, or perhaps out of necessity. If there's a lot of people congregating, they need to go farther afield and test out different raw materials. So we see that over time. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, um, I mean, if you could go back to before the micro technology system at all, how long would it take before the question of whether they were able to do it? Is it something that I'm um, sorry, how long? How, how long does it take for the civilization to get to the point where they had no, no technology to do at all to where it was in your study? Very difficult to say when we're talking about these time spans, mostly because our resolution isn't as fine as we would like. So when we get these radiocarbon dates, we can, we can get a kind of plus or minus 50 years in some times, which really means we have a 100-year error uh, or time span of which we're unsure exactly what was going on. Um, in order to learn these techniques, if we're really talking about you know, a couple of years for one individual practicing it uh, quite a lot. So when we find changes in technology, dramatic changes in technology, like from an um, Acheulean hand axe that we have in deep prehistory, so a very large you know, bifacial hand axe, kind of a, a very blunt chopping instrument, to these very delicate microliths, um, that's easy for us to identify archaeologically, but not to pin down in time, especially because we often see overlap in technologies. So it may be that a person who is very good at making large flint blades um, has somehow, perhaps that part, the first time that happens ac accidentally, that you figure out, oh, well, I could actually just make smaller versions of these, and this is much easier because I don't have to replace the whole blade. You can just pull out part of it. And then that gets perpetuated. But at what pace that is learned by a larger group of people, we, can, we don't have the resolution to, to tell at the moment. But, yeah. Uh, follow, let me follow up on that. Were there any other uh, pieces of technology or structures, I'm thinking maybe of the hub itself, that apply the same concept of miniaturization? Uh, not really. So we only see this in the tools, in stone tools. So when we look at other types of points, so we have bone points, for example. Um, I showed a few examples. Those are actually, you know, we're talking about pieces that are this big or bigger. So it's really just with the stone tools that we see this, this kind of miniaturization, as you say, these micro Yeah. Why? We don't know. <laughs> yeah. But something's puzzling me about, and you say so far, we're talking about these micro lids, sort of replaceable. Of the site, 
to a depth of about 50 centimeters. In some areas we've done deep trenches, but those are very limited. And we have over 4 million limits. So a ridiculous amount of, of stone. So of what, we, of what we have sampled that come from these particular contexts, the hut structure and deposits around it, we have not yet identified any raw material that comes from outside of the vicinity. And we've done a, quite a few analyses. You know, we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces, tens of thousands of pieces, actually. So it's possible that people would have carried a few pieces with them. Um, but it would be just that. It would be perhaps a small pouch with a few blade lids in it, enough that would get you to the site. They're not bringing big blocks of flint to, from outside to reduce there. So you would use what you have in your bag, probably on the way from wherever you're coming from to the site, and then once you get there, you kind of re you gear up again. You can use the raw material at the site to make a variety of new replaceable parts. So I can't rule out that there aren't any at all, but there's certainly, if they're there, we haven't found them yet, which suggests there are very low numbers of material coming from elsewhere. This is before ceramics, so what were they using to contain water? So although we don't have it preserved at this site, from other contemporary sites, so some of those other dots on the map that I just showed, some of these other sites, we actually find basketry. Um, and you can use the same thing that you use uh, to pack these microbliths into, into the foam handles or wood handles, so bitumen basically this natural tar that comes from the Dead Sea, you can use, and we find it sometimes, uh, lining the inside of baskets because it waterproofs them. Probably also animal, animal guts, animal stomachs, um, animal hides as well. Question? Yeah. What would be the percentage of, of these microliths that were hafted onto other tool bodies and what percentage would be used just alone in the hands of the author? Yeah, so uh, about 95 or more would be hafted. They're pretty small and they're pretty pretty fiddly on their own. So you can see some of the earlier photographs. There was one of me holding three of them on my fingertip. So they can be pretty small. Um, the only instance where we suspect they might have been used individually is where we have them pointed on one end and they would be used for fine drilling of some of these very small marine shell. But otherwise, we, we suspect they are probably all hafted. Although not all of them show evidence of that kind of thing. So, and similar to the flint raw material study that we've done, surveying around the site to check what's local and what's not local, we've done the same thing with the red ochre that I've mentioned, and the orange and yellow and other colors of ochre. And so we've been able to identify a variety of outcrops, and again, using the chemical signatures from the archaeological ochre and the source ochre, we can actually say that the material is also coming from a small area around the site. So you can see the localities mapped out a little bit easier on the other map on the right. If we look at the animal remains, so we can use the animal bones themselves, even when they're highly fragmented, to identify the species that were exploited at the site. And what you can see here is a whole variety of different species. So we have tortoise, owl, a variety of different um, avian material, ostrich, hare, fox, wolf, hyena, wild boar, wild cattle, wild um, horse, and what I've highlighted in, in yellow here, gazelle. Because as you can see by the numbers, this is only one small example. Gazelle overwhelm all of the other species. So while there's a wide diversity, in terms of what people were consuming, it was overwhelmingly gazelle. And we see this in the faunal remains. We even see it in the horn forest that you can see um, around the hut structures. Not only were they consuming these gazelle, but we actually think they were consuming them in large enough numbers so that there would be a surplus of meat that would be dried um, and stored for later use. Possibly even, in some cases, uh, feasting events where we have extraordinarily dense deposits of animal bone. So things that we, as excavators, just call bone beds because there's, there's almost no dirt while we're excavating, it's just bone. And you can see an example of one of them in the photograph in the top right. So basically all, of, all that you can see there, all of those little brown bits are um, gazelle. So end of, we're talking about 10 to 12 individuals of gazelle. So a substantial amount of meat. 
they were also using their horn cores to help make these microlithic stone tools. So in order to you know, bash open these big blocks of flint to get these bladelets that you can make into these small microliths, you need implements to do that. And when we're talking about very small pieces, you're not going to use another big rock. It's kind of overkill. So you would use one of these finer gazelle horn cores, such as you can see right here. And we often see them broken on one end for that particular purpose. So aside from the fact that we have a lot of gazelle, I should mention that are coming from a variety of different places. We have both sedentary gazelle, so gazelle that live around the site year-round, and mobile gazelle that are coming particularly from Syria in the north towards the site and even from the south up. So we find people are also coming probably from these areas following the gazelle, um, which were congregating around the Azraq Basin for a large part of every spring. The fauna tells us not only about what people were eating, but about the local habitat. So it gives us an idea of what animals could have survived in that environment. Animals like cattle and tortoise and boar, wild boar, need to be near large permanent sources of water. So to have them at the site tells us that we're not talking about a dry, water-deprived environment around the site while people were living there. We assume that because we have a large number of people living there. But we can actually demonstrate that by the fact that water-dependent animals were living in the vicinity of the site. Especially with wild boar and cattle, these are not animals that you're dragging dead carcasses very far. So you're not hunting these 50 kilometers away and dragging them back to the site, or probably even 5 kilometers away and dragging them back to the site. So they're representative of what's going on in the local environment, so what the local habitat was like. We see that with the animals, and we also see that with the plants. So I mentioned we have very good preservation at the site, largely in the form of charcoal, so all those black specks, which we can examine under the microscope. Um, once we've isolated the individual fragments of charcoal, which you can see in the bottom right here, we can actually look under the microscope and look at the structure of these pieces of charcoal. So you can see some of two different types of structures here, one with these very large capillaries and one with a variety of smaller ones. The internal structure is specific to different species of plants, particularly woody plants. So we can actually identify what types of plants people were using as fuel for these hearths in the construction of these hut structures, and that also gives us an idea of what the local environment would have looked like. So we have a lot of shrubs, um, a lot of grasses, a very uh, substantial grassland environment, but also some trees, including tamarisk, wild almond, wild pistachio. So again, very different from the landscape today. We can even look even more minutely, so going at a scale much lower than the charcoal, we can look at these um, plant remains that are called phytoliths, which are basically very, very small, you know, sand grain size and smaller um, silica uh, deposits that again have their own unique structure. They're produced by plants. So when a plant decays away, these little bits of silica that form the structure of the plant preserve because they're mineral, so they don't decay away. And different plants produce different shapes of phytoliths. And we can identify the species of plant by looking at the shape of these phytoliths under the microscope. And here are some examples over here. So if we take even just one example, this very irregularly shaped uh, phytolith right here is a phytolith from a grass husk. So we know that there were a variety of different grasses. Um, we find these actually in all the deposits, but particularly around the hut structure, which tell us what the hut was probably built from. So a variety of brushes um, and, and grasses that would have been the superstructure, the covering of this hut structure. So rather than the upper photograph of the environment around the site that we see today, it actually would have looked a lot more like the lower photograph, which comes from the Azraq Oasis I mentioned, a photograph that I took not too long ago, but again showing that we would have had a variety of small lakes and streams, grasses, uh, even areas of um, tree coverage. So an environment very different from today. 
and in the interest of time, I will um, summarize, actually I've talked about most of this already, that beyond just looking at the fauna, looking at economy, looking at what these structures were made from, there's really interesting things inside. So we've talked about the marine shell already. We find it in a variety of different forms, which you can see um, in the top right here. Not only do we have shell that's been pierced, which you can see here, but we have animal remains, including this wolf tooth that's been pierced and strung. And we have stones that have been intentionally carved, geometric designs. And we even have pieces of bone, which have been intentionally incised. We're not exactly sure what the significance of these incisions are, but they seem to be marking something quite intentional. The one that you can see uh, probably best, the large flat one in the bottom, actually has a pattern of six incisions, a space, four incisions, a space, six incisions, a space, four incisions, and so on and so forth. And we actually have multiple pieces that have that exact same pattern that don't fit back together. So it was done multiple times, multiple contexts um, around these hut structures. And then when we put that together with the caches of objects of marine shell, of flint, of red ochre, of gazelle horn cores, and the fact that we also have human burials at the site, we know that people were, were doing pretty interesting things symbolically and ritually associated not only with these hut structures, but in other parts of the site as well. So if we put this all together to summarize, we have, in fact, a really significant site at Hrana, a very large site, a site that's going to keep us busy for a very long time to come. But it's not the only site on the landscape. It's a big one, but we have a landscape that's filled with all of these dots. And that's traditionally how we've approached the hunter-gatherer landscape. You have a whole variety of isolated sites that belong to small groups of hunter-gatherers who are kind of just in their own little world, um, living in a small area. But if we put the material from Piranha together, we look at the marine shell, where it's come from, and what it might say about interactions between people. We look at the fauna. We look at, oh, the lithics are in, the, in there as well. We probably actually have a much more complex landscape. People moving in a variety of different directions, rarely going as the crow flies, so traveling large distances or at least involved in interactions with each other over fairly large distances. And so we probably have a landscape that would have been busy with paths and trackways um, in between all of these sites. So rather than isolated dots on a map, we have a landscape that actually would look like this. And so we may be able to see these individual sites like Karana that have hut structures where people are doing interesting symbolic things, not only symbolically destroying these huts, but doing interesting things inside of them and in the spaces between, as representing this idea of establishing, especially when we talk about you know, about a thousand years or so, of people establishing some kind of permanent idea of, of home. So we don't have to have a you know, square stone structure for people to have had a connection with not only the site of Piranha, but perhaps even individual structures in the site. But if we broaden that to the larger landscape, all of these sites would have been connected to each other, and it may be that we see a landscape that was considered home by these hunter-gatherers. And I'll go through this very quickly, again, just talking about the very different landscape that Piranha would have been situated within about 20,000 years ago. This is a picture today. You can see the site here highlighted. It's this kind of slightly darkened area with a little fence around it. You can see our truck there. And we can actually mark out areas where there would have been lakes adjacent to the site. We can map this out using uh, geomorphological analyses of the sediments from a variety of these sections. So there are several of these sections marked here five of them all together, including the deposit of the site here, the deposits of the site, which give us an idea of a much different landscape. We see these lake deposits even below the site. So this, these kind of white marly deposits are lake deposits, which we can in fact see at the base of one of our deep trenches. And these are actually the post holes, these dark stains are post holes for another structure, which we haven't even 
begun to uncover yet um, that are dug right into these lake deposits. So as the lake dries out, people are inhabiting its edges for prolonged periods of time, eventually establishing the site itself. So to sum this all up, we have a lot of evidence for both mobility across a large landscape, but also aggregation of people at the site of Piranha. They clearly had a pretty substantial investment in that particular place as meaning something in the landscape and over a long period of time. But we also probably have, and what we are still not great at detecting archaeologically, what our future work is to do, is looking at all of these spaces in between the sites, which were also quite probably very intensively occupied. So we're not talking about individual dots that represent sites with these kind of blind spaces in between, but instead a much more interconnected network of what's going on in hunter-gatherer house and home and landscape. And to sum up all of uh, this work is not just the work of myself, but a, a variety of different colleagues and collaborators um, at a variety of different international institutions, some of which I've named here, the communities we work with in Azraq, the Department of Antiquities in Jordan, and a number of other funding bodies as well, as well which I've listed here. And I will end there, and I'm happy to entertain any further questions. of 
doing Paleolithic archaeology is it's really, really difficult to get at the temporal resolution that we want to be able to denote individual events. And partly because the dating techniques we use don't allow us, allow us to do that, but also over 20,000 years these deposits have experienced a lot of a lot of weathering and a lot of change that doesn't allow us to do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what is the significance of the stone catches of the chunk of oak? Good question. <laughs> so we, we know it's a pattern, yeah, we know it's a pattern that we see repeated over and over. It's possible that they were cached there with the idea they'd come back later on and recover that material. So the cores aren't exhausted. The big chunks of flint that the platelets come from, you could actually still get some more platelets out of there if you wanted to. We have so much raw material in the immediate area of the site, they don't have to conserve raw material. So it's not that you would have to make sure you got everything you needed to out of one little piece of flint. A lot of the other small platelets and microliths haven't been used at all, haven't been formed into final tools. So it may be that they were going to come back and dig up those caches and then use that material. It was just not needed at the moment. And the ochre may have been part of that. So if you're using ochre to stain marine shell or for any other purpose, for body paint or, or staining other things, then you may want to keep, you know, like these replaceable tool parts. You may want to actually have a little bag that you can carry your ochre around with you. If you don't want to carry all of that stuff for one reason or another, you might cache it somewhere, mark that so you can go back to it and collect it. So it may be that, or it may be that these caches were never designed to be found again. We have no evidence that there was anything marking where they were. So either people made very good mental maps, or a map on something that hasn't preserved, or they were never meant to be reopened and reused again. So for example, we suspect with the hut structure we have these three caches. Each of those caches of marine shell that I talked about, that each had a big piece of red ochre, we're talking each one of those is a collection of about 500 shells. So it's a pretty, pretty substantial cache. Those were very intentionally placed on the burnt superstructure and then very intentionally buried in this really distinctive orange sand. And this was only in exactly the boundary of the floor of this hut structure, again, coming back to your idea of the boundaries of these, these features. So it's pretty clear that those were never meant to be dug up again. Unfortunately, they didn't have these great archaeologists years later. But, but exactly what the significance, whether they were on purpose or, or some kind of symbolic thing that was meant to be left alone, um, we don't know. themselves, 
gives us an idea of how people were hunting. So I could have gone on for ages and ages about this. But looking at these mortality profiles, we actually see a change over time in people um, actually hunting together more. So we see communal hunting, probably with large game drives, which we actually still find in other areas in the Azraq Basin. So people are going out um, in large numbers, herding and driving these gazelle so that you can pick off a whole lot of them at once. And then once you have you know, 50 to 100 gazelle carcasses, when you're processing those, you might, obviously you're not consuming all of that right away. So we think they're probably using these racks over top of these hearts, drying the meat, storing it for later, perhaps in the feasting events where they would be consumed, and then dumping all of that bone into these massive heaps that still have no partially articulated carcasses in them. Yeah. And the more gazelle mortality stuff is quite interesting, because basically we see a lot of adult males being hunted in the early part of the Epipaleolithic, which is when you had individuals going out and killing one uh, individual um, gazelle. And then over time, we actually find adult males, females, even juveniles being killed, which is what you'd see if you're killing a large number of a herd at one time. Um, and in fact, over time, over this 10,000 years of the Epipaleolithic, we take not only Verona, but a whole variety of other sites and look at the hunting patterns that we can see with the gazelle remains. Um, they were probably a large contributor to decimating gazelle populations in the region. So they were relying so heavily on them that they were basically over-exploiting and over-hunting them. So by the end of the Epipaleolithic, they're, they're basically fewer gazelle and they're killing anything they can find. So even very young gazelle, pregnant females, you know, things that you don't kill if you want to sustain a gazelle population, any animal population over the long term. So, yeah, I think you had a question here in the picture. Oh, I was thinking about the opera, yeah. which has been done in a very size all over. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at the picture of the muscles with the opera on it, and they were going to cover that up, that must have been some spiritual kind of thing. And yeah. And the, Probably, probably, I agree with you completely. Um, in fact, uh, so I work at this site, but I also have another site in the northern part of Jordan that I excavate, which is a burial ground. It's a, a cemetery. And one of our most interesting burials from that cemetery is a, a grave that's been reopened three times. Um, the first person was buried on basically a bed of red ochre. Um, you have one person laid out a whole variety of flint and ground stone tools that were placed there with them and actually a portion of a fox skeleton. So the articulated skull of a fox was buried at this person's foot. Immediately beside there, we have a completely separate grave that happened probably a little bit later. We have another individual buried with large pieces of red ochre, a whole variety of flint tools and ground stone, and the completely articulated body of a fox missing its skull. So although, the genetic material isn't preserved. It's old for us to say definitively that the same fox was split between two graves. The morphology, so we look at the age and the sex and the size of the fox, suggests that this was one fox that was actually split between, between two individuals, both of which had red ochre associated with the, the burial ritual. which 
again, it gives us an indication of quality of life, but on a different side. Um, if we look at disease and pathologies, osteoarthritis is the most common. In terms of other types of pathologies or indicators of health, the other significant thing we find is teeth that are really, really healthy worn. In most cases, all the way down to the root. Um, so if you're if you're living long enough, you're eating a very rough diet that is uh, eating away at your teeth, so to speak. Um, but also you're doing a lot of physical activity, probably a lot of repetitive tasks, whether that's splint mapping, whether that's running or other activities involved in, in hunting. If you're living near water, it can involve puddling, um, stooping down to collect cereals. Um, so we see a lot of kind of repetitive stress indicators on the skeletons. But actually, to be honest, it, you may, some people would argue, and I think my colleague Jay Stock would argue, that overall health is probably better than you see with later on Neolithic populations, where this repetitive stress is even worse, you know, bending over in fields, bending over grinding grains, um, and eating a diet that's not as varied. So eating a lot of high-carb foods, we start to see a lot of dental cavities, a lot of a lot of dental disease actually with Neolithic populations that you don't see in the near rear gatherers. It was rough, but not as rough as in uh, you mentioned that uh, teeth would be worn down from a from the knee pattern. Uh, what was their diet? So it would have been a variety of plants, um, grasses, things like wheat and barley, um, a whole wide variety of different plants, um, pea, plug, legumes. Um, the grinding down of the teeth comes from the processing of these plants. So you're processing them in stone uh, mortars yeah. and with stone. Um, Hand stones. And so as you're processing them and grinding them down, little bits of the stone oh, break off, and so you, basically that's where the wear comes from. That's what I was wondering. I couldn't understand. For one thing, they could also cook their food, did they not? Yes. And so I couldn't understand where they would be found. It was the so like, little grits inside of the food that come from the processing itself. The house was still in there, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, I found it strange that uh, within these huts that they would have alternating layers of hearth and, and earthen floors. Uh, if it was my hut, I would just clean out the, the hearth after I have cooked and then use the same floor. Why would they keep up? So those ones that I showed were actually outside of the huts themselves. So where we have them inside of the huts, we actually do see them cleaning out parts. So cleaning out all of that messy burnt ash material, all that charcoal. But outside, um, we don't see them cleaning out. Presumably there's no need to into a slightly different, different area. Yeah? In your, one of your charts, you showed the, the use of the various food, the animal, some animals that they got were in the yeah. animal for the greatest gazelle for the biggest population. Yeah. You have three uh, columns there, the early, early middle, and middle. It seemed as though the middle, the early middle was, was a period when they weren't. Is that a period when there was, the site was not as occupied or or less people were there because of the lower numbers of animals there. And can you talk about how the um, how the site was used and when it would stop being used and what were the conditions that would cause that yeah. that to end? Was that because of drying or was the environment drying out and yeah. moving uphill or downhill or something like that? Absolutely. So in this uh, graph that you can see here, we have the early, early, middle, late, and middle. So what I've shown is just a small fraction of one excavation square. So rather than showing you ridiculous numbers that go across the entire site, um, you know, we're, we're talking about, we also have in the millions when it comes to faunal remains. Uh, but if we look just at one of these trenches, one of these deep deposits, we have early at the bottom base of the deposits, then we have a period in the middle where we can't tell exactly, even with the radiocarbon dates you can see in the air, if we're talking about the early occupation or the middle occupation, but that's a pretty restricted um, transition zone, basically. And then we have the middle deposits on top of that. So early is transition period, and then middle. So earliest to most recent. If we look over time, you can see, so this is our kind of transition period. For the moment, we'll just ignore that. We have 
such a small number because it's really an artificial period. Part of this piece of that would belong to this, and part of it would belong to that. We just don't have the resolution to tell at the moment. But what's pretty clear is that there's a heck of a lot more gazelle in the middle, in the more recent. So this comes back to this point I was um, saying earlier of changes in hunting strategies. So they're kicking up their intensive use of gazelle. It was already pretty intense in the early heavy pal, but it becomes even more intense over time. And part of this has to do with larger numbers of people working together and, and communally hunting to get larger numbers of gazelle with every any given hunting event. And that uh, results in the larger number overall of, of animal remains. How does the site end? Right, so I mentioned that overhunting becomes a problem. So we see that at Piranha, but also at a variety of other sites. That also is compounded by a pretty dramatic climate change. If I go back way to the beginning, I showed you that chart that had uh, blue, cool and dry, orange, warm and wet. So, and I mentioned that what's particularly interesting is the time period that this site is occupied is supposed to be cold and dry. So it's supposed to be a time period that's not great for people to be living in this part of the world. It's the last glacial maximum, basically. So it's the last really cool period as the ice age is kind of dying away and giving away to the Holocene. So it's this area, this period right here. This is the occupation of the site that is in this orange um, rectangle. So it's supposed to be cold and dry. And then we're supposed to have a nice, warm, moist period, which intuitively you think, okay, that should be a great time to live in, in this part of the Near East. The problem with these regional records is they're just that. They're giving us a very gross idea of what's going on in the region as a whole. So all the way from the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, up north into Syria. But it doesn't tell us what's happening in individual micro environments, micro habitats. And what's going on in eastern Jordan, in the Azraq area, where this site is, is actually entirely the reverse of this trend. So because we have this large oasis, and because we're in a, an environment further to the east of where all of these records come from, we actually see the opposite of the last glacial maximum. We have actually a lot of precipitation. Everything is pretty lush. We have lakes around the site, we have a lot of grasslands, we even have trees in an out desert environment. Once we get to the supposed warming period, it's nice and warm in the Mediterranean coast. We start to see the environment, the Mediterranean environment we see today. But in the eastern desert, it's really warm, definitely. But instead of being moist, all of these surface lakes are drying up. So with higher temperatures in the desert, we have higher evaporation of water near the surface. So it's hot and dry. Hot and dry is terrible for animals and people that are dependent on water. So whereas in most of the rest of this region, we don't start seeing these hot, dry conditions until the onset of the Holocene, we start to see them about 6,000 years earlier at Verano. And what we see at the site is these lakes dry up. All of the vegetation and the animals that they supported start disappearing, essentially. And therefore, it's no longer the nice, attractive place it was for people to settle. So after about uh, 17 and a half thousand years ago, the site is not occupied any longer. In fact, the entire area is not occupied. Which two are so the NDSL? Sorry, I'm not. Oh, meters below sea level. Yeah. So Lake Lizon is a large freshwater lake that occupied the basin that is now the Dead Sea. So the Dead Sea is now extraordinarily salty, drinking every day, um, and basically uh, fills that basin that's part of the, it's actually part of the central African Rift Valley. It's the northernmost extent of it. During the Pleistocene, so this time period during occupation of the site, that basin was filled by a large lake called Lake Lizan, which was actually almost freshwater. Not entirely freshwater, but almost freshwater. So sites around there would have also been able to exploit aquatic resources. But another reason why I said you can't take um, distances as the crow flies 
we go to a map of the region. So this is the Dead Sea now. But this entire basin, this is the Red Sea. So this is actually one deep Rift Valley. Yeah. Um, the Dead Sea now. All of this area would have been underwater, under Lake Bizan, this large freshwater lake. So groups would have were traveling to Piranha from the coast, getting these marine shell from the Mediterranean to Piranha, would have involved either going pretty far up north to go around by land or crossing on some kind of watercraft, which of course hasn't preserved archaeologically, but it's entirely possible. So you mentioned blood force trauma in the analysis of, of human bones. I mean, did you see evidence of a human or human fighting? Or? So it's very rare, but and much less rare than we see, again, in the Neolithic. And I'll talk about why in a second. But in a few instances, in these cemeteries, so these burials that belong to the epithelial period, we find microliths, um, basically projectile points, embedded in the bones of there are a few instances of interpersonal violence. Um, but as I said, not as much as we see in the Neolithic period, um, which in some ways might make some sense. So we might start to see things like interpersonal violence at a site like Piranha, although we haven't found evidence of it yet, where you have a large number of unrelated people who are coming together and have to learn to get along. So you suddenly have to spend very close quarters and much more time than you're used to with people that we are not related to. In the Neolithic period, when people really start settling in these permanent villages, so these large villages that you can see on the left, then you're basically living day to day with people who are not related to you. And that requires some social negotiations that people are just working through, and sometimes not so well. Yeah. Where, where did the name Quran come from? So it's named after the, this dry river valley that goes right by the site um, of Piranha. Uh, in Arabic, it roughly it has a, it's been transliterated many different ways, but its original meaning in Arabic um, has to do with hot winds that characterize the area today. I don't know now when I first heard that site over there. I assume Jordan is a safe region to travel to because uh, right now Westerners are very much in danger of being to Syria. Yeah, well, yeah, it would be with Syria at this point. Yeah, Jordan, we're, we're very fortunate working in Jordan for a number of reasons. Um, it is a very moderate country. Um, politically, it's pretty stable. It's actually one of the large stepping stones for the U.S. into the Middle East. <laughs> so where a lot of the troops and stuff in Iraq were launched from, um, in fact, very near to this site. So politically, it's pretty stable um, and, and quite a safe place to be, as much as I can say for any part of the Near East at this point. I mean, knock on wood, it's, it's a nice and safe place to be now, but you know, things can, can always change. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one more question, if you uh, look at the landscape, it's all desert, and, that, and before you find the site, how do you locate a site and find all that layers and layers? How do you yeah. find the site perfectly? So this site, we were quite lucky because there's no other plants or trees around to obscure the site. So it stands out on the landscape. Um, just walking over that landscape, you look down and you're basically just, you know, Taking a step, my fellow colleagues who come to visit while we're excavating are always shocked and horrified. I, I just get used to it after being there for so many years. But you walk over the site and it's basically just crunch, 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 crunch. Because you're stepping on artifacts, essentially. It's the surface pavement. On the, surface. the reason why the site has been so well preserved for 20,000 years is because of all of these splints. So this surface deposit is what we call a flint pavement. And it's something that just happens naturally. We have really durable rocks um, in an otherwise sandy sediment. So the sand is blown away every year. We lose some of the surface of the site um, and have done since it was entirely de-vegetated 
but the flint stays behind. And so over time, all of the sand is blown away, and the flint is increasingly concentrated, so that it makes almost a continuous pavement and protects it from future wind-blown hazards, basically. So because of the flint pavement, the site is now protected from being continually blown away. Every time we excavate there, we disturb that flint pavement because we want to excavate what's underneath. When we finish excavations, we have to put sediment back in. We usually actually buy clean sand with no artifacts in it, so we can easily identify where we've dug before. Um, we cover our holes back, and we, put, we keep the flint that we removed from the surface, and we put it back on afterwards. Because if we didn't, the next year we came back, everything would just be blown right out again. If that the site wasn't so obvious on the landscape, um, the, only, the only real way for, for detecting these sites, especially when they're much, usually much smaller than this, is to, to be walking, to be surveying. So we can use a lot of fancy remote sensing equipment, we can use aerial photography, we can even use satellite imagery to help us try and find areas on the landscape that would have been likely locations for a site for a variety of different geological and, and geomorphological reasons that we think people would have lived there. But really the only way is to actually walk over the area and look for artifacts. Even then, it's possible that things are buried and nothing's on the surface. So sometimes we just decide, this, you know, we seem to see a pattern at epicalyptic sites tend to be on the edges of river systems, particularly where two rivers come together. So even though we don't see anything on the surface, we're actually going to dig some small holes to see if there's anything below the ground, below the surface. Yeah. So that's, that, that combination of techniques is how we find these sites. Yeah? Those lines, did those have anything to do with No. So we built a fence around the site because uh, a lot of the local Bedouin who live in the area were driving their 4 by 4 wheel trucks over the site. I, I don't know why. It's more of a pain in the butt to drive over the site than it is to go around. Track. And those are the tracks from these 4 by 4s yeah. So we have built a fence around the site now, so those, those, and the, those tracks are, you know, 5, 10 years old. It's still, still persists on the surface. The other really sad thing, it's very fortunate for us that we have such a massive site to work with, because these are, these are excavation trenches. This, and a lot of these little pop marks, are either looter trenches, or um, the Jordanian military used to use the site as target practice for mortars, for mortaring, because it, believe it or not, you know, it's only a very small rise on the landscape, but it's the biggest feature on the landscape. So that was the site was their target, very unfortunately. So yeah, <laughs> all of that stuff today, though. I'm happy to say the Department of Antiquities of Jordan now owns that land, so it's protected from, from the future. Find any unexploded ordnance in the ground? Um, we found already exploded ordnances, but we haven't found any. <laughs> we try to stay clear of those very obvious things. Well, thank you all.